So, Chris, it's ten past the hour. Would you like to introduce yourself and introduce us in some way, and then I'll take over from you. Will do, Simon. So, thank you and, and welcome everybody. For those of you who are joining your first session of the convention, uh, welcome to the convention. For those of you who are here, here after having seen a little bit more of what's gone on this morning, I hope you're enjoying it. So, you know, it's the fourth annual convention for the People's Powerhouse. Um, first one being in, in Doncaster, then we were in Bradford, then Sunderland, and we were due to be in, like Strictly, we were due to be in Blackpool in the ballroom this year, but didn't quite manage it, but we'll be going back there next year um, with a fair with a fair wind. Um, and I, I think you'll, you'll all be aware so far from, from what you've heard that, you know, what we're really trying to do is, is just create a platform for voice. That That is kind of in a nutshell what the what, what the People's Powerhouse is about. And you'll have heard a bit this morning about how that feels as though it's a more important issue than it ever was kind of prior to, to, to COVID and all of the challenges that we're going to face um, in the North of England over the next year. So, so what we want to do through all these sessions is, is just make sure people feel and become more connected to each other. And so I'm sure Simon and the team will, will bring people in to, to, into the discussion today and we want you to all feel free to do the chat box etc you know explore connect with each other uh, and that would be one of the outcomes that we're looking to get from from this um i'll be just as i said a couple of minutes ago for those who were on just catching a few of the threads of the conversation and feeding those into some of the wider plenary that we'll be doing and also through the chat there's a couple of points where i'll also paste um a couple of links which basically just make sure that everybody knows whether going it's like knowing which room you've got to dash off to when you're in a, a real life conference i'll just be pasting a couple of things there um little um plug if you don't mind for the youth takeover tonight you know we're really pleased that we've got young people kind of taking over the convention uh, after about 4 15 so um please yourselves and also if you have children who'd be interested in that please um do feel free um so, so just to this session, and I am also very interested in, in this, um, you know, from a personal and professional point of view. And 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 Simon and the and the team are going to talk us through work on what I think should be called twenty first century city. Is that right, Simon? Uh, yeah, sounds sounds good. <laughs> it's a twenty first city, and I wondered whether that was a reference to size or something. But I think it must Not be size. Yes, <laughs> So we are now in your hands, sir. If you don't mind introducing yourself, your team, and talk us through the exciting things that you're doing in, in and around Sheffield. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, yes. Um, so team seems a bit um, presumptuous on my part, so <laughs> but these are certainly some fantastic fellow Sheffielders. Um, and um, so I'm going to try and give you a kind of brief introduction to this event. Uh, which I kind of pitched to the People's Powerhouse. Um, and so I'm very pleased that People's Powerhouse were willing to include us. And um, I hope that, that you're going to find this interesting. I think Sheffield Sheffield is a brilliant city. It's a city I think everybody on this panel loves, cares about, uh, and want to turn, turn into an even better place. It's got a fantastic history, a fantastic history of kind of radical commitments to social justice and democracy. Um, but I think it's fair to say it's been going through some pretty hard times, economically hard times, as in many other northern cities, but also hard times in terms of its own governance. And I think you're going to hear some really interesting uh, perspectives on that in this session. Um, I started talking in the city at the one of the city's wonderful assets is the festival of debate and uh, so i've run a couple of sessions in the festival debate which has been an annual conference organized by opus independence and you'll hear from james Locke, who's one of the founders of opus independence later um i've been talking about why why is a city's structure so centralized the uk is massively centralized anyway but for a city of half a million people, why is all the power um, controlled from basically a council where, rather than being embedded in our neighbourhoods? Why is a city of Sheffield with a population of over half a million 
um, run by effectively a parish council kind of structure and where all of the neighbourhoods, and there are 142 neighbourhoods in Sheffield, why have those Sheff those neighbourhoods not got their own life and structure and democratic voice? Uh, that's the thing that's really concerned me. And as I've looked around the world, I've seen many places where you can see much better representation, democratic involvement for people that can only happen at a at that kind of human scale. And it's completely missing from Sheffield. So that's that's in a way one of the ways I've got involved in this conversation, just wondering how we could get citizenship, people's real involvement in the city to become something much more real and lively. And the other thing that I've been wondering is why don't we have a constitution? I mean, Sheffield is a as big as a country. You know, Iceland has a population of 300,000. It's got a parliament, it's got a president, it's got a constitution, it's got 78 municipalities, a functioning welfare state. That's the country of Iceland. And, and we really have none of those things. Uh, we don't have a framework that the citizens of Sheffield can examine, debate, talk about, amend, that says this is how we run the democratic life of the city. So it's from this kind of perspective that I've come and and, um, um, and we're still exploring some of these questions in the city now. Um, I, I basically reached out after agreeing to run this session with People's Powerhouse to just people I know, respect, doing brilliant things in the city. So um, I think I'm just going to introduce you each one at a time rather than introduce the panel, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, as I say, if we'll just try and stick to kind of five minutes and I'd encourage people to um, put things in the chat bar, which we may be able to pick up, but we've obviously got a very tight schedule here. Um, but the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Vicky Seddon, who is um, from Sheffield Democracy, which is this amazing. We have a campaign group in the city, a long-standing campaign group, working on the whole issue of democracy in the city. So. Vicky, tell us something about the work and your perspective on, um, on the city. Okay, thank you. And very nice to be here and uh, very pleased that um, the powerhouse has, uh, has, uh, has invited us to, to, to speak to you. Uh, yes, we've, uh, we're, we're uh, interesting that Simon talked about the constitution because uh, in a way, Chevy for Democracy has been very much involved with formal structures of democracy and how they work or don't work and how to try to improve them um, and we've had we've had a group for about looking back with the history for about 30 years when we were to start with we were Sheffield at the Charter 8 Sheffield Charter 88 when the 1988 uh, when uh, the, the Charter was uh, was was first launched um, and uh, we uh, uh, we're, we're a non-party aligned body and we try to be very careful about trying to include people across the political spectrum uh, and to be critical of all the parties and what they're not doing uh, rather than uh, supporting any one particular one. Um, we are, um, uh, 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 we have a steering group of about 10 people. We have a supporters list of about 180 uh, who get a regular newsletter from us. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things I'm going to be doing today is trying to finalise a newsletter and sending it out. Um, and we have about 300 people who follow our Facebook. And, the, and we've tried, we, re, we, we concentrate on a wide range of issues. Local issues, yes, but also national issues. Um, for example, uh, we, are, we, 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 we do always do work around the accountability and transparency of the local governance arrangements to do with the City Council, its procedures, access to information, access to counsellors, uh, etc. Um, we also are very concerned about the lack of community engagement that you referred to, Simon. Uh, and I know um, that Nigel is also very interested in all of that, uh, where, whereby communities have much more say in what happens in their community and in terms of shaping city council policy and procedures. Um, we, the centralisation of powers in Westminster, away from local authorities, has been so destructive, so undermining of uh, uh, lo localities, uh, because the money has been withdrawn and withdrawn and withdrawn. So councils, in the end, 
can only end up doing what they're statutorily responsible for, rather than the wide range of things that councils and, their, and the people in the place want them to engage in, because there just is no more money. And not only is, is the money being reduced, uh, if you like, percentage-wise, but the funding formula has been changed so that instead of the needs of a local authority being taken into account in terms of deprivation, et cetera, it's been done much more these days on a kind of a per capita basis, which has effectively meant that richer, more prosperous uh, areas have gained more and the deprived areas like, for example, in particular, Liverpool and Hull have lost a lot more. Um, we've also been working uh, and particularly working at the moment on the campaign for a fair voting system to move towards proportional representation. We've been looking at what our MPs think about that in Sheffield. And we, uh, we've just, just this afternoon put a report on our web page uh, that shows where they stand and how much, how much further we've got to go to persuade some of them that they've got to change their minds and come up with and support a progressive uh, approach to voting systems. We're also very pleased to work with other people, other organisations. For example, Sheffield Climate Alliance, which has just had a wadge of money. Um, uh, we are look, we're working with them around trying to make sure the participation, in particular, of underrepresented groups. And we're also in the, on the, pro, in the process of making a submission to the Sheffield Race Equality Commission, which has arisen out of the Black Lives Matter at campaigning and we're very happy to do that and i'm delighted you know that, that, that there's so many different people here from sheffield who are want to speak for their organization and their campaigning and that whole thing about different approaches different ways of doing things that might suit different people in the community i think that's a richness that we have in sheffield and something that i very much welcome so back to you simon you're muted Simon, you're muted. <laughs> well done. That was beautifully timed as well. Thank you. Uh, let's see if I can now put Shelley into the spotlight and I'll try to unspotlight. Yes. Okay. So next we have uh, Shelley Cocaine, who's going to tell us about, I think, the campaign with the most brilliant name in the world. I think it's our city. So um, I'm not going to steal any of the uh, of Shelley's thunder. I'll let you um, tell us all about how that, where that's come from, and what it's achieved, and where it's going, Shelley. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm just going to tell a simple story, really, of the background of it's our city, um, and really, it's a it's a tale of people power, I suppose. So um, some of you might have heard that Sheffield had a problem with its trees. No, it didn't have a problem with its trees. It had a problem with the council that the tree fiasco exposed. Um, it was a council that had had, uh, apart from two short bursts in the noughties, I think, held power for over 80 years and absolute power bestowed on them when the city was forced to change governance to an executive or a cabinet style system some years ago. And it had become to take its electorate for granted and actually started to treat them with contempt. The tree debacle exposed that we'd had a council that refused to listen to those affected and its communities and refused to listen to experts. Um, and they continued to make bad decisions and bunker down instead of admitting that they were wrong. When a council attempts to lock up its own citizens for saving environmental assets or for any reason, uh, you've got to step back and conclude there's something seriously wrong. Whilst the tree campaign had been rumbling along for years, um, it's our city, don't forget the exclamation mark, um, started in 2018. Um, it started uh, just a few random people from various campaigns, mostly true ones though, I suppose. Um, we got together to consider how to redress the democratic deficit and for communities to be heard. And our first campaign was um, for the local elections in 2018 which I suppose was a tactical voting campaign, really. Um, we chose six target wards, uh, drew up some community pledges from, pledges from open meetings, and um, told voters in those wards how important their votes were this time. Five out of six of those wards changed hands that year. And there's no way of proving that it's our city, you know, 
had any effect on that really, as the parties would claim credit for themselves. But when a win by set was won by 17 votes, you have to wonder if it was us who found them. Um, emboldened by that success, and upon the chair discovering a gem of legislation in the Localism Act 2011, we gave notice to the council with much fanfare that we would be campaigning to activate our rights enshrined in that act, which could lead to a citywide referendum on the appropriate style of governance for Sheffield, that being cabinet versus a modern committee system. We had to get 5% of Sheffield's registered voters to sign our petition. And as the fifth largest city in England with over half a million people, 5% is not a small number. In fact, it was 20,092. After meetings with democratic services about if we could have an e-petition as the legislation didn't include them, they didn't exist at that time. Um, it was decided that we could, and we launched our petition uh, from the Lord Mayor, Majid Majid's chambers in the town hall. He was warned he shouldn't sign, but we had 20 representatives from all sorts of community groups who attended and spoke at its launch. Of course, a petition on local politics and governance is not going to take off like wildfire. It's not exactly saving Wales or um, campaigning for pay rises for frontline staff. And by October, with possibly about 3,000 signatures, we realised we were going to have to, um, it was going to be hard work. And most of the signatures were going to be obtained from long winded, one by one, conversation by conversations. In the new year, we rallied the troops and took our campaign to any meeting, any group, any event that would have us. We stood outside mass social events, remember those? Markets and supermarkets every day and every weekend for months. Or even when we knew we had over 21,000 signatures, we had to keep going to the very last minute as the thought of not reaching the target and signature, as there were verification failures, was just too awful to contemplate. We amassed over 26,000 signatures and 15,000 of those were face to face. The night before it was submitted, two of our eminent councillors uh, signed the petition and once we'd submitted it, they later resigned that day. Over that weekend, six council cabinet councillors, cabinet, six count, no, oh, I knew I was going to fall on this one, six cabinet councillors and their supporting staff, also councillors, resigned from their positions. The legislation states that a citywide referendum must be held within a certain time frame, and our, refer our referendum was tabled to take place with our local elections this year. Like most things, it's been postponed until 2021. Nevertheless, we're riding high today, along many other campaigners, to hear the news last night that the leader of our cabal has resigned and will leave in January. So 2021 is off to a good start already. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. That was excellent and also very timely. Let's see. So, Nigel, let's see if I can spotlight Nigel. I've done it. <laughs> so, Nigel, I'm really pleased Nigel can join us. It was a few years ago I met Nigel and he explained his kind of ongoing role of, of kind of one-man scrutiny of civic governance in the city. And so um, I'm delighted that he can join us now and give us his perspective on what but the history of some of this and and what some of the prospects looking forward might be. Go for it, Nigel. Thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, it's a few years since we met and we've corresponded more than we've actually met face to face, I suspect. But uh, we've also shared platforms in a number of events um, and I've been delighted um, in as a, an active citizen in Sheffield to have been involved with most of the people on this uh, this panel one way or another whether it's uh, helping with it's our city's campaign um, the various campaigns of Sheffield for democracy or as a regular contributor to the festival of debate um, but I, I do very much want to look to what's going to happen uh, long term in Sheffield or uh, short term and long term to a certain extent because clearly one of the key issues for Sheffield at the moment is who will be the new leader um, I know who I think it will be uh, but I'm not going to give anything away. Um, having talked to a number of um, local Labour Party people over the last few days, uh, knowing that this was coming up, 
Um, but it's going to be key as to how the city moves forward because we actually made some progress over the back end of 2019 and into the early part of uh, 2020. Um, as Shelley commented, there was the success of the uh, It's Our City petition, meaning that council had to look at how they were going to deal with uh, governance into the future. Um, and uh, I think several of us here were people that made submissions to the council's um, committee that looked at how they might change to a committee system from um, strong leader and cabinet model because that had to be something that they put on the referendum for May. Uh, that didn't happen um, but prior to that not happening council had also committed to looking in greater detail at how we might drive democracy down to neighborhood levels and I know Simon was very keen on uh, what we might achieve with that um, and depending upon how the leadership changes and whether or not that desire survives the pandemic, I hope to pick up with that uh, next time we have the opportunity to start having public meetings again. Um, the key thing about that is I am a real believer that we must make local government changes from the grassroots so that people, local people, people that live in the city are those that have the greatest influence over how local government works. It's been part of the way that I've dealt with local government uh, in my scrutiny role, or as they might put it, objectionable interferer, um, over the last eight years. Um, and there have been some successes along the way. We now have webcasting, which thankfully means that everybody has the opportunity, or at least everybody with web access, has the opportunity to see their council in action. Um, COVID has created issues over scrutiny because uh, not being able to attend meetings in person and the vagaries of the way decision making is now happening with most decisions being made on a day to day basis by officers um, and councillors, even cabinet members, uh, having a much uh, smaller role in decision making is problematic, in my opinion, um, and hopefully will not um, last much beyond um, the needs of the COVID pandemic. I'm also a keen believer in devolution and devolution to the lowest possible level of decision making. Hence the ideas around uh, neighbourhoods and having neighbourhoods with serious decision making powers and where possible fiscal responsibility for elements of their decision making. Things where local people can actually make a difference to how their local area responds to issues, whether it's something as big and as dreadful as a pandemic, or whether it's something as small and as straightforward as whether we need more trees in our parks or on our streets, and whether or not the street cleaning could be done better. So all those things actually matter to people on a day-to-day -day basis are very important. And that devolution requires centre to give up control. And that's one of the key issues we've had with Sheffield City Council. They are showing signs that they are more prepared to talk about that now, but actions speak louder than words. So I will still be pushing come the next opportunity to keep that neighbourhood's devolution agenda on the report block book. Um, alongside as well my watching brief as one of the few people who actually attend city region meetings um, because although um, they are effectively an elected body because you have a mayor who was elected the scrutiny of city regions is awful um, there are none of the ones outside of London have um, any sort of um, citizen base to its scrutiny. It's entirely down to already uninterested local councillors to actually put their four pennies in. And without something of an elected nature or at least a citizen nature, they are able to make decisions as mayors that are virtually unscrutinized. And that cannot persist. That needs to be dealt with. Um, 
I think the other thing that we need to consider briefly for next year is that Sheffield may, or might, in May, be a no overall control council. And in that situation, all bets are off. Thank you, Simon. Back to you. That was brilliant again. Thank you, Nigel. Um, so now, oh, Ruth's disappeared from my thing. This is a <laughs> terrible. So now I want to introduce uh, Ruth Milford. Ruth is um, a friend and an ally. She, like I, um, is um, involved in the Labour Party. And also we work together in the Yorkshire Socialist Health Association. Um, and um, by, I know that Ruth is also very involved in thinking about how her own community functions. Um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to Ruth's perspective on this complex uh, picture. Ruth, go for it. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, um, so I'm, I am an active Labour Party member uh, and uh, I hope I can call myself a very active citizen in our city. Um, and uh, I feel it's possible I'm talking into a bit of an echo chamber here, but, but I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so there is a big question mark over local governance and democracy in Sheffield. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people recognise we've reached a point where there's a lot of frustration with um, an outdated model of governance. Uh, and uh, Shelley and others have talked about that. Um, speaking from the perspective of a, a very active member of the Labour Party here, uh, which of course is the ruling group in the City Council, um, I can tell you that although opinion is not united, uh, there is a very strong groundswell of party members in our city who very much believe that, that, that the top-down system of governance um, operating through a tribal oppositional style of politics is uh, very outdated um, and uh, really unnecessarily insular. Um, and uh, in Sheffield, of course, for those who recognise uh, that democratic deficit um, and how ineffective a strong leader and cabinet system can be, uh, the hope is to bring in a modern committee system, uh, but securing a referendum and winning that referendum is only the start of change um, and a new system is only going to be as good as the councillors and of officers who operate within it allow it to be. Um, and we have to be aware that a committee system could be designed and run really badly uh, and result in just as much frustration as the system it replaces. Um, so I, I would suggest that a mindset shift needs, needs to take place as well, uh, not just the design of the system, but the way that people think when they're elected to represent others, um, away from what's become a comfort zone of introspective and top-down decision-making uh, that's about exercising control, uh, and more towards our, elective, our elected representatives um, of any party, letting go of party tribalism um, and that oppositional politics. Um, and we need our councillors to adopt more of a spirit of cooperation um, so that representatives elected by our city citizens are all able to take part in decision making. Um, it's, I think it's well known that um, a lot of our core cities don't have singular identities and Sheffield is characterised by one of its six constituencies being ranked um, 526th out of 650 on the national scale of deprivation, uh, whilst just literally down the hill uh, is a constituency ranked as the seventh most deprived uh, in the country. So to me, it's so important for such a diverse and divergent and economically divided uh, meta community, if you like, as a city, to have a properly uh, representative governing body uh, and that kind of leads me on to proportional representation and a bigger campaign for a bigger system change, but that's definitely for another day. <laughs> um, but I wonder, could we even one day achieve a situation where um, perhaps rather inspired by the flat pack democracy project in Froome, uh, which is well worth reading about if you're not aware of it, where party whips are no longer the guiding hand in um, local governance, but election candidates of whatever party actually talk to each other um, and uh, maybe can agree on the general principles of building up a healthy community, a healthy town, city, county, whatever their local organization is and where differences of political opinion um, actually inspire genuine debate, um, and where every citizen is, tre is treated as an equal stakeholder. 
uh, and the recognition that everybody is a stakeholder is so fundamental to a modern successful participatory governance system that stakeholders are not just business people and as Nigel suggested uh, you know on the wider city region level um, investors and anchor, anchor institutions are those consulted and those who have the voice uh, and citizen level engagement just isn't there um, so I, it's been amply demonstrated uh, this year by the circumstances of coping with uh, such a serious pandemic uh, that our response to meeting basic human needs as a society is uh, potentially turned on a light bulb um, mutual aid groups um, sprung up overnight across the whole nation. I started one here in my local community, um, along with others who I'd never met before. We just all got together on mostly via Facebook and WhatsApp and organized this thing out of nowhere. Uh, and it really demonstrated the eagerness of people to work in societal structures that are responsive to need and visionary about the future. Um, and that demonstration of the capacity of so-called ordinary people to identify need and respond to it and cut across red tape um, should really be taken seriously by councillors and council officers uh, and I think should be one of the things that is right at the core of informing a modern participatory way of running um, our city and hopefully other places as well. Um, so I'll leave it there because my time's up, could go on forever, um, but uh, we'll see what happens next May and hopefully a lot more of us can work together uh, and really have meaningful dialogue about how, how to go forward in Sheffield with uh, something that works for everybody. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ruth. I think that's one of the things about Sheffield, isn't it? It's a, it's a city where, while there is party politics, people like working together. And it's, it's a real shame when we allow kind of tribal things to just um, we lose the plot, really. And, and it's not like, that's not the spirit of this city. Uh, by any means. Um, and actually a good person to actually talk a little bit about that is Chiwe, who's who's on next. So I know Chiwe through working together around, particularly around the UBI lab work, but Chiwe's work also has been very powerful working with some of the most excluded groups in the city. Sometimes people are not just excluded by poor income, living in the wrong area of the city, but by the hostile environment created by central government uh, attacks on refugees and asylum seekers and other issues. So, so I think I'm just going to move to the, I don't know where we put that little echo from. Maybe it's my fault. So here we go ahead. Uh, thanks so much, Simon. My name is Chiwe and I work for um, Opus Independence and also particularly on the UBI Lab network. Um, which which Simon has attributed to there. Uh, my prior my prior engagement has been primarily with the refugee and asylum seeking community. So um, I'm part of Migration Matters Festival as well, and part of that means that I've had insight into. Um, people facing extreme poverty in the UK, uh, people with no recourse to public funds, for example, but also different aspects that are um, that. Uh, uh, that are crucial to how uh, the city's poverty levels are and what poverty people, uh, how people are engaging with that and which people are being left out in, in, in the conversation. So with the UBI lab network, I, I, you've probably picked up that there's been a lot of uh, conversations around universal basic income around the country, around the world, especially post pandemic. Um, although uh, prior to that, system, so, um, the welfare system itself has failed many people. So universal credit has left out lots of people, for example. And um, apart from the pre-pandemic challenges, post-pandemic, the systems, financial security systems that were put in place themselves um, have failed also further mil uh, millions of people. And so we've seen a growth with the UBI lab network and the echoing voice around what a universal basic income could be. So I'll just tell you a little bit about how uh, that informs the conversations at a local level, as well as influencing policy at national level and how people feed into that and the work that we are currently doing. 
So there have been several motions uh, to back a UBI that have been passed in multiple councils around the country. As at today's count, there have been 13 motions passed and 11 of those motions that have been passed around the country have been through the work of the UBI lab network, uh, which is an organized, uh, which was founded by Opus Independence through the Festival of Debate, which is very much a Sheffield festival. So we believe that there are better ways to provide security uh, to citizens. And we think that the best way to do this is to enable and resource citizens from the grassroots up to engage with civic and political society to explore the potential for universal basic income for everyone. And we, um, we also believe that uh, there, there, there are four values that we work by, that a UBI should be equal, it should be simple, it should be inclusive and it should be democratic. And when we're talking about it as being democratic, we're looking at allowing people to contribute to their community and amplifying participatory, deliberative and representative forms of de democracy as this panel is seeking to, to discuss today. So this speaks to the desire to create a more positive democratic and dynamic future for Sheffield. The UBI lab network itself is decentralized and it includes citizens, researchers, activists, and campaigners um, who are looking to explore the potential for a universal basic income. So every single lab is citizen-led. It's a citizen-led group. And like I said, the first one was born here in Sheffield. 35 of, uh, so there are 35 labs and uh, 30 of them are in the UK. And quite crucially, 25 of these labs are geographically located, are geographical labs. So others are interest area, uh, interest area groups uh, such as disability, uh, LGBTQ, um, arts, and the like. But they're all informed uh, within the local democratic context. So these 25 are informed within the local democratic context as people choose to play a greater part in their local lives and in decision making. Um, so how are the practical ways, some of the practical ways that we are inviting people to, to engage with this conversation on universal basic income and also just exploring and influencing and informing policy out there. Um, UBI Lab Sheffield is a cornerstone for people who are based in Sheffield and the lab is existent and invites people to explore the possibilities of a basic income um, basic income and within that we could look at considerations of what a micro pilot that is informed by the people of Sheffield and within Sheffield could look like. Then the second thing that I want to bring to your attention is uh, the uh, cross-party parliamentary and local group that is, um, is, is, a group, is a hybrid I would call it for now of, of an APPG but this is something that we we created uh, it's coordinated working across all levels of government so you've got elected representatives from the grassroots um, so you've got the, your, your local councillors you've got your uh, metro mayors and you've got parliamentarians and uh, lords within that and the the People like Natalie Bennett are part of that, but also we've got Alison, uh, Alison Teal from the Green Party, who is part of the co-chairs of that group as well. And so we're, we're, we're getting local, local representat representatives to engage with, um, with people in uh, policy making decisions at Westminster so that we can bridge the conversation between local representation and um, national government level. And I think I'll end there before I time out on my five minutes. Thank you. Chiwi, that was brilliant. And, and again, I think it's really interesting, um, the power of the UBI Lab Network to build those bridges, build those bridges. Um, I think there is a power in the local networking with the local that can then have a, a kind of national force that we've not really seen in other areas, I think. So it's a very exciting model, which I think could also apply in other areas of kind of democratic reform um, in the um, in the city. And uh, let me see if I can get. Uh, yes. So and the next person to speak is uh, James Locke, who um, 
is well i also i also want to say james runs opus but then i get confused by your incredibly democratic cooperative structure so then i retreat into in some way kind of coordinates or runs uh, but you'll do a better job of that but opus is um for people who don't know it outside sheffield is the font of so much good stuff um and james has been um one of the major originators of brilliant things uh, but also has i think a really interesting perspective on um what the voluntary sector if we could call it that um might might evolve into in a better 21st century so james go for it thanks simon and um thank you for being here as well you know it's really great to have this conversation um and it feels like a conversation at the moment as well, which I think is worth noting. Um, so, so I think just to respond specifically to what Simon's asked me to speak to today, which is around um, how the voluntary and community sector could be uh, effective in this neighborhood democracy space, in this devolved uh, democracy space. And I think in a wider electoral reform space as well. Um, view space a lot there. I keep using the word space and uh, I'm not quite sure it's uh, really the right word, but it feels uh, uh, that it captures a lot. Um, so, so I tend to approach some of these questions from, uh, from a position of, of problem solving. And one of the great things about problem solving is that it releases value. And as a society, what, what we, we do really is uh, encapsulate and um, redistribute, hopefully, value. So when we think about the value of the voluntary and community sector, um, we might draw out things like um, doing it for the right reasons or doing it from a sound moral base, um, which I think is broadly true. Um, we might also point out the value of trust in communities, something that um, is is easy to lose and hard to come by. Um, and then to, to broaden that context a little bit more, um, we might again um, think about some of the things that, that Nigel touched on, which were around um, the restrictions of local authority funding um, and the problems that that causes for local authorities if they do wish to be uh, devolving power. Um, and I, I believe that there is a, um, a role for the voluntary sector in, in democratic participation. I believe that that role is um, resourced by the, by the trust that, that many voluntary sector organisations have in communities and by the increasingly social enterprise model that voluntary sectors, organisations are having to take on board. Um, and I also think that councils, um, I, I think that the frontline concerns of administering a council under such severe austerity prevent the, um, the time and the, and the thinking space um, to have a, the bandwidth for this sort of ambitious um, devolved vision. So I'll cut to the chase. I, I don't see why at the moment, voluntary sector organisations couldn't position themselves as with a democratic mandate. Um, I don't see why it isn't possible to augment representative uh, democracy with a deliberative form of democracy that is led and facilitated and delivered by voluntary sector organisations. Um, in the long term, I, I hold the view that a participatory uh, democracy structure is really what we should be aiming at. And to offer some clarification on that, um, because I'm aware of the mixing of, of all these terms, I would, I would view that as having some sort of budgetary uh, responsibility. So I would like to see a future where neighbourhoods have a say in if not control of uh, budgets that relate to decisions which affect uh, the people who live in those communities. And I don't think that that's 
outrageously radical, to be honest. I just think that's that's common sense. And that's how do you solve a problem better? Well, you solve it closest to the problem, don't you? Um, and if the problem is felt at a community level, then it makes perfect sense to me that those people are in a very good position to, to resource it. And I think there's something to be said for giving people agency um, in that decision making. And again, from a problem solving perspective, if you give somebody agency in a decision, it's more likely that they will take ownership of that and go the extra mile or expand their thinking uh, to, to resolve it. I think the other really important thing just to note about agency is the increasing evidence uh, to support the idea that uh, agency in communities uh, leads to better health outcomes. And, you know, if, if the last eight months have taught us anything, it's that health outcomes are absolutely critical, aren't they? And it's also taught us that when we think about communities and need, that's the thing that brings people out of their doors to help one another. It's health outcomes and it's well-being. And as we move more towards uh, thinking around donut economies and well-being as the outcome that we're all seeking, I don't see uh, what really how you can have those conversations without simultaneously having a conversation about the devolution of, of power into communities and neighbourhoods. Um, so, so I guess that, that's my kind of position really, is I think the voluntary sector have a role to play in this. I think that they can relieve some of the weight from the local authority. I think that fundamentally it might improve the relationship between local authorities and the voluntary community sector because at the moment that relationship is governed um, a lot of the time by the rules that surround procurement and a kind of very commercial service delivery model which doesn't really reflect the type of work being done. Ultimately, I think the way to start this, this process is by um, understanding a model and looking at the detail. And I think the two big questions in that are, um, how do you divvy up, let's say, um, a city of 650,000 or whatever it is into uh, meaningful groups. As Simon mentioned earlier, 142 neighbourhoods in Sheffield. Um, at the moment we have a ward system, so we have 28 wards, roughly around 20,000 people in each ward. Um, take that down a notch and you've got somewhere in the region of sort of three to five neighbourhoods in each ward. Um, a neighbourhood maybe touching on around four or 5,000 people, something like that. Um, can, can, how do you get that small enough to have meaningful conversations? I think that's a really big challenge. And then how do you follow it back up as well? So if we were to say um, that there were gonna be a number of deliberative democracy spaces across the city, um, where does all that information go? And how, how is it presented in a way that the council are able to uh, include it in their mandate and include it in their decision-making? Big question. And I, and I think the answer is, just one that we will have to get to through long discussions like, like this. Um, the other big question I think in this is, what are the right methods of, of engaging communities? And how can we create um, a structure that is flexible enough um, for those communities to inhabit um, while still serving the purpose of um, those communities being heard and the council hearing those voices? And of course, the feedback loop question, how do council make decisions using community views and then feed those back to communities? So I think there's a lot in, in this that remains unanswered, but it, for me, feels very hopeful and very straightforward um, in terms of its outcome. I'll stop there because I'm conscious of time, but thanks, Simon. Thank you, James. I've taken spotlight off everybody. I think, um, Chris, we're like two minutes from end of play. So as I suspected, giving everybody five minutes and just allowing for normal human stuff didn't really leave any time for discussion. Um, and th there were a couple of really good questions as well. Warren just posted an excellent question, but I think if like if we just began to start to answer Warren's question, so I encourage you to look at it in the chat. Uh, I think there are some really interesting things one could say to it, but we'll just we'll just lose the remaining time, which is now one minute. So I'm just gonna um, 
say one thing, which is Sheffield is, I think, a really hopeful place. Um, and uh, oh, I'm viewing Vicky said the screen. I think Vicky may have accidentally clicked something. <laughs> um, the um, so so Sheffield is a place where we we can describe some of the problems we've been. But I think if you if you're from outside Sheffield, I'd say keep an eye on what we're doing. There's going to be some interesting stuff happen next year in Sheffield. I think some very positive stuff. I'm sure we'll have our difficulties, but this is a city with half a million plus brilliant people in it. And we might have been going down the wrong track for a wee while, but I think we're going to get on track. That's my belief. And uh, so I don't know whether Chris, if Chris is still there. Yeah, Chris, yeah, would you I like am. to just kind of sign us off in some way? Yeah, well, first of all, so I'd say, you know, I wouldn't have missed any of those inputs. They were all so, so good. Uh, and I'm gutted really that we can't carry the conversation on. I'd certainly be up for reconvening at some point in the future if, if people would want. Um, I, I've uh, I've got some kind of personal interest in this in a way, in that what in my personal life back in, in Nosley and Liverpool, I had to campaign with lots of other committed people to save a park that was going to be sold. And we, we, we um, badgered the local council about not wanting to end up like Sheffield Council <laughs> over the trees, which was a bit of a tactic because they were in the middle of the, uh, of the press storm at the time. So, uh, but they made me feel, feel so powerless. You know, I've worked for 30 odd years. I've worked for prime ministers. I've worked for ambassadors. I've worked all over the place. They made me feel so powerless and all the people with me, but until we won. So, you know, I'm really interested in the kind of conversation that we're having. Um, I think from the powerhouse point of view, I'd say there have been some really, really important messages you've given today that we'll definitely make sure to fed back into the plenary. And I would say to you all in Sheffield, good luck, best wishes to you. And I'm more than happy, Simon, I'm certainly keen to hook up with you again if we can. And, um, keen to talk to you all in the future. That'd be fantastic. So I've put some notes in the chat just about what's next and just some invites to other sessions that you might want to look to next. But thanks very much, everyone, for all your, your time and input today. Thank you, Simon, as well, for convening. Thank you, Chris. Thanks to everybody. Brilliant panel, I, I must say, friends and comrades. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to staying in touch with the People's Powerhouse movement. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.